Jim. Seventy-five. Seventy-five. <clears throat> Let's sing out big tonight. We can make a joyful noise. I am full. I am the vine, and ye are the branches. Their precious fruit for Jesus to gain. Branches in Him, no fruit ever bearing. Jesus has said. Mark the imitation 288, 288. <clears throat> and once you've marked 288, if you will, turn back to 84, 84. <clears throat> we'll sing this song, and Brother Jim will bring our prayer to us. <clears throat> Staring with me, O my Savior, for the day is passing by.
Let us bow. Our Father in heaven, we come together once again near the end of this Lord's day, thanking thee for your love and care and for all the many blessings you've provided for us that we enjoy every day. We're thankful, Father, for the church that meets here and the opportunity such as this is that we can assemble together to worship thee this evening. We're thankful for the rear avenue of prayer, and we pray your blessings upon each individual assembled here at this time. We pray as we enter into the worship service this evening that, that the things we say and do will be pleasing to thee, and we can worship thee in spirit and in truth. We're thankful you have revealed your word to us that we may learn more of your will as we live our lives closer to Thee as we live here on this earth. We're thankful for Your plan of salvation and the giving of Your Son, Jesus Christ, and His willingness to die on the cross for our sins, that we may have hope of heaven someday. We're thankful, Father, for the health that we have and help us to be mindful of those of our number who are ailing in some way. We pray their health may be restored, if that be your will. We pray for the shut-ins, that you'll continue to comfort them. We pray for our elders here, and help us to encourage them as they're overseeing our spiritual needs. We pray for Brother Chuck as he stands before us proclaiming your word. Help us to be attentive to what is being taught. As we're entering into another week, help us to realize our great need for Thee every day. We pray we'll always have a proper love for Thee and for each other. We pray our service will be acceptable to Thee. And if we have sinned, Father, we beg Thy forgiveness. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn to 97, 97, and if you feel like it, stand as we sing this song. 97, we'll sing all the verses of it, 97. Oh, to be like the blessed Redeemer, this is my constant longing and prayer, glad the forfeit all of the treasure. Jesus, I
Sure, good to see each one of you here this evening as we come to worship in spirit and in truth. It's interesting because we have sickness in two families and that whole back corner is empty. But you're here, and that's what's important is to be here. We wish them to get to feeling better so that they can be back with us at the next time. Going to be what I call, I guess you might say, all my lessons for that. But a simple lesson this evening. I've titled my lesson this evening, Bible Basics. When I talk about Bible basics, more or less I'm talking about Bible ABCs. Now you say, Bible basics, Bible ABCs, what's that? Well, I'm glad you asked, because we're going to spend the rest of the evening talking about the Bible basics slash Bible ABCs. So as you can see, we're going to have just one chart tonight as we look at these Bible ABCs. And this is something I've done in classes and private studies and something I've preached on before, but Bible ABCs. Now, you could have put some things different, but you're going to see how this all ties together. So when we look at Bible ABCs, of course, we've got to start out with A. And the A stands for attitude. Did you ever stop and think about that? If you do not have the right attitude, or if I do not have the right attitude, we'll not understand the Bible like we should. We probably won't even turn to the Bible. So first and foremost, starts with the A. I have to watch my attitude. Now, the thing about the attitude is that is something I have to watch all the time. My attitude might be good today, but there's no guarantee my attitude will be good tomorrow. And again, my attitude is going to in, be involved in how I respond to the Word of God. So let's look at some passages talking about the good attitude. We could have a whole lesson or a series of lessons on attitudes. But when we talk about the Bible ABCs, as we look at these Bible basics, let's look at these passages. Luke chapter 8. Turn with me, if you will, to Luke chapter 8 and verse 15. Of course, as you turn to Luke, you know what I'm doing here as I'm going to the parable of the sower and the explanation of the good ground. And in Luke chapter 8 and verse 15, we have this stated for us. But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word, listen, with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. So here we have it, the noble and good heart. What do we start out with as we talk about the Bible ABCs? Attitude. Do I have, do you have the noble and good heart? Now let's go to a few more passages along those lines. Turn with me, if you will, to James. In James chapter 1, in James chapter 1 and verse 21, it starts out telling us, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul. So you have the good and noble heart. Here you have received with meekness the implanted word. But it starts with attitude, does it not? The attitude that we should have. And then, of course, I'm going to give you an illustration of this in action. And that's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. So let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, as we talk about these Bible ABCs, it states, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it in truth the word of God, which also effectually works in you who believe. Now let me ask you this. If they did not have the right attitude, would the Word work in them effectively? So when we talk about the Bible ABCs, it all starts out with attitude. Now, quite simply, as you follow along, and notice I don't have 26 marks, so we're not going to do the entire alphabet. So when we look at the second one, we've got the Bible. So we've got the right attitude towards the Bible. You see what we're doing here. If you don't have the right attitude, you can forget about going to the Bible. But let's talk about very quickly some passages on the importance of the Bible. In Romans chapter 1, in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, we're all familiar with this. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, 
for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Now, where's the gospel? Well, the gospel is within the Bible, is it not? So we started at our attitude towards the Bible. You see how we're doing this? All right, let's go to Acts chapter 20. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 32, speaking of the Bible, the Word of God. We have recorded for us there in Acts chapter 20 and verse 32. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the Word of His grace. That's the Bible, is it not? The Word of His grace. What's it able to do? Which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So it's the power of God to salvation. It's able to build us up. Now, one more passage as we look at this B. Turn with me, if you will, to 2 Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verses 16 and 17. Of course, we're all familiar with this. Many of us can quote this. But in verse 16, it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped to every good word, every good work. So what we have here, the Bible is God's power. The Bible is able to build us up. And the Bible is able to make us complete. But it all starts with the right attitude towards the Bible. So we start out with attitude, and then we go to the right source, the Bible. Now, as we continue on this very simplistic lesson on the Bible ABCs, I know you know what the next one is, conversion. Now, we can't have conversion without the Bible, and we can't have conversion without the right attitude. You see how this all ties together? This all kind of falls in line with one another as we talk about these Bible ABCs. So let's talk about conversion real quickly. Remember in 2 Thessalonians, go back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 14. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 14, it says, "...to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ." I know I sound repetitious, but this is pretty simplistic, is it not? Starts out with our attitude, going to the right source, and then here we learn in this passage, we're called by what? The gospel. But now being called by the gospel, we've got to respond to that. That brings us to a passage we often go to as we talk about conversion. Let's go back to Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2. I use Acts chapter 2 on many, many times, both publicly in preaching and also in private, because people want to change what God's Word has to say. A lot of people have been deceived into thinking that there are many roads to heaven. That's not true. There's one road to heaven, and that's the way of the Bible. And very clearly on the Pentecost, on the day of conversion, after what did they hear? They heard the gospel, and what did about 3,000 do? They responded favorably, did they not? And they asked what to do, and very clearly in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, it goes on to state this, And Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now look it down to verse 41. Then those who gladly received his word, what? Were baptized. Well, that's pretty simple, is it not? Now, why were they baptized? They heard the word, the Bible. And why did it affect them? Because you had about 3,000 who responded favorably. They had the right attitude. Were there more than 3,000 people there? Yeah. Yeah but they had the wrong attitude. So just because the right message was being preached and the right instruction was being preached, it only responded favorably to about 3,000 because they had the right attitude. This is Bible ABCs, attitude, Bible, conversion. Okay, let me give you one more illustration of that as we go on. Turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 8. Again, nothing new tonight. In verse 35, oh, by the way, if you ever hear some preaching that is totally new, reject it. Reject it, because we've got everything complete in here. 
in Acts chapter 8 and verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the Scripture, and what did he do? He preached Jesus to him. Now, as they went down to the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? I want to stop at verse 36. How did he come to that conclusion? He's listening to Philip. What's Philip doing? He's preaching Christ. And preaching Christ, he's preaching the need for baptism. That's the Great Commission, is he not? See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? And what happened? Both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he was baptized. But he had a right attitude, and they went to the right stores. So the attitude needs to be right. The right source is the Bible, not doctrines of men. And then again, that will lead to one's conversion. Simple enough. Now you're trying to guess what's D. Let's get to that. As we look at this Bible and the basics of Bible, we've got doctrine. Doctrine's important. Let's go to 2 Timothy again. And 2 Timothy, while you're turning to 2 Timothy, I've heard people say this. Well, we all believe in Jesus and therefore, it really doesn't matter which doctrine we hold to. Have you heard people like that? Well, it does matter. It does matter which doctrine you hold to. And we find that the doctrine we must hold to is, goes back to the Bible, in the Scriptures. In 2 Timothy, we have recorded for us chapter 3 and verse 16. It goes on and state, I should get in the right book, I'm in the wrong book of Timothy. I could quote it, but I'm getting too scary to quote because my memory plays tricks on me. So in verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration and is profitable, given, to God, given by inspiration of God and is profitable for what? Doctrine. Now your version might say teaching. Teaching is doctrine. But we're talking about now the Bible. So, so you have the conversion now you have to follow the doctrine, the teaching. But where do we get the teaching? Well, it says the scriptures are profitable for doctrine. So you have the attitude, the Bible, conversion, and then you follow the doctrine. That's kind of simple, isn't it? It all goes back to this book. So again, as you, you sit down and study with people, if they say, well, I don't agree with that, well, that, that's up to them. It goes back to the attitude. They have the wrong attitude. They've gone to a different source. There aren't many roads to heaven. There's one, the doctrine of Christ. Let's go to another passage as we talk about doctrine. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13, we have recorded for us here in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13, hold fast the pattern of sound words. So it tells us we have a pattern. What is that pattern? It's the doctrine that is within the Scriptures, is it not? Again, people don't do it, I don't think, today, or if there are some, it's not many. I remember as a kid, my sister and my wife, they would buy patterns. Remember that when you'd go to the store and buy pattern to, to make clothes? And they would follow that pattern to develop various types of clothing, would they not? They, they would get the pattern. I don't even know if they still sell patterns. They would cut out the pattern. They would buy material. They would pin the, the pattern to the material, and they would cut that out. I think I told you before, my wife, when we were first married, tried to make me pants, and she got a big chuckle out of it because when she didn't put it together, it looked like uh, Omar the tent maker. But the point is, there was a pattern. Where's that pattern? Goes back to B. In the Bible. You see how simple that is? It's not hard. It's just that people don't want to do it that way. You see, they want to go to the Bible and say, yeah, doctrine, but I get to change the pattern. What happens when you change the pattern? It's not going to look like the pattern that you see on the picture, correct? Things are going to be different. And that's what people have done with religion today. They've changed the pattern. The pattern of religion today, the pattern of the church today is totally different than what the Bible teaches. Because instead of going back to the Bible for the pattern, they have adjusted the pattern. They have made a, just, a judgment. A, in fact, they have just thrown out the pattern and come up with a new pattern. Uh, when you look at religion today, instead of being spiritually focused, it's socially focused. Instead of being growing spiritually, it's entertaining. 
and feeding physically. You see what's happened in many churches? Many churches, they, their goal is to feed the hungry. Well, that's not the work of the church. That's the work of us as Good Samaritans. Not the work of the church. That's not the pattern. Uh, those with kids, we want to keep kids to be spiritual. Well, it's not the pattern of the church to have get-togethers to go to Disney World based upon and functioning of the church. Not the work of the church. I like recreation. I like entertainment. I like athletics. We don't have a right to build a gymnasium. Would we draw people if we built gymnasiums? Absolutely. But it's not the pattern. We're keeping with the Bible ABCs. We've got to keep the pattern, the doctrine that I said. Oh, by the way, remember I said some people say, well, doctrine's not really important. You ever hear people like that talk like that? We all believe Jesus is the Son of God. Therefore, doctrine, so you have this doctrine, and I have that doctrine, and my neighbor has this doctrine. We have all these different doctrines. That's really not important. Let me tell you something. They didn't learn that in the Bible because the Bible teaches doctrine is important. Turn with me, if you will, to 2 John. In 2 John and verse 9. Listen to very clear here. It tells us here in 2 John verse 9, Whosoever transgresseth and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. Now, what's hard to understand in that passage? It goes on to state, He who abides in the doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. Okay, question, where's the doctrine in Christ? 2 Timothy 3.16, in the Word of God. What was Timothy told to? Hold fast to the pattern. So if you don't abide in the doctrine, if you've thrown out the pattern, you can think whatever you want. You don't have God. Well, Chuck, you shouldn't say that. I'm not saying it. John is saying it. Don't put the blame on me. John is saying how important doctrine is. That's one of the issues I had to deal with when I became a child of God, and we had the various denominations we had to deal with from our family members. Because they want to say, well, it really doesn't matter. We still all believe in Christ. No, it does matter. Because looking at the Bible ABCs, we have got to follow and continue to follow the doctrine of Christ. This all makes sense so far, does it not? We've stayed within the Scriptures. It's not really that hard to understand. Here I go again. Why is it hard? Because people are helped to misunderstand. If you don't remember anything about me, remember that. People are helped to misunderstand the clear teachings of the Word of God. So we go on, so okay... I had the right attitude, I went to the Bible, I was baptized, and I'm trying to follow the doctrine. Now I got the next letter. Edification. That's a part of it too, is it not? So as we look at edification, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Oh, and by the way, I've used this not only in preaching, but I've used this to teach a class. With, with new people or ones who are converts to show here's what we have to do. Here's your Bible ABCs. Where are you on that chart of the Bible ABCs? Are you following the doctrine? Now, it's interesting because if you know 1 Corinthians 14, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, those three chapters are speaking, Paul is speaking to the church at Corinth, dealing with their misuse of spiritual gifts. And the process of 12, 13, and 14, a few weeks ago we talked about, in 13 he brings out about biblical love. But in chapter 14, because it appears to be that all of them were really seeking the gift of tongues. Now, there are religious groups today who believe still in the gift of tongues, but it's not biblical tongues. It's not. Now, they're deceived. They think it is, but it's not. Uh, very first time I heard, quote, unquote, somebody speak in a tongue, it scared me to death. I didn't know what that, and this is, person is sincere. I didn't know what in the world that person was saying. 
Oh, and by the way, neither do they. And there was no interpreter. So they already violated Corinthians. Now, I didn't know that at the time, but I know that now. And when we talk about tongues, the speaking in tongues, you go back to the day of Pentecost. And on the day of Pentecost, not the whole group, but the 12 apostles got to speak in tongues, right? But then it says, how hear we every man in our own language? So the tongues they spoke in were known languages. If I were to have the gift of tongues, and I believe the gift of tongues was for a limited period, and it's no longer in use today, but if I were to have the gift of tongues, it would possibly enable me to go to Finland, part of my heritage is from Finland, and without studying one iota of Finnish, I could speak fluently in Finnish. Now, I'm told as a small child, my grandmother taught me Finnish. Now, I don't remember that. I have remembering yesterday. But as a small child, I guess I spoke Finnish before English. In fact, I spoke so much Finnish before English that in grade school, I had to go to speech classes. And some of my letters till to this day, I have trouble saying, such as my R's and some other things. I try to avoid things like that. Now, someone says, do you still know Finnish? Well, I know some words, but I don't know what they mean, so I don't know if they're cuss words or good words, so I'm not going to give any Finnish words. But whatever Finnish I did know, it was taught, taught. And the gift of tongues, there'd be no teaching of that. I could set foot in Finland, and if I had the gift of tongues, I could fluently speak Finnish without studying an iota of it. That was the gift of tongues. Again, that was limited in the first century. Now, I said all that to say this because they were clamoring over the gift of tongues. And here's what Paul said in chapter 14 and 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 12. He said, even so you're zealous of spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. In other words, instead of you puffing yourself up because now you've got this unknown language you speak, let it be for the edification of the church. And that's the E. That should be our goal. Now, what does edification mean? It means the building up. Let it be for the building up of the church. So let's go through our chart. We go through our chart. I have the right attitude. I go to the right source. I'm converted. I follow the doctrine of Christ. And I try to build up my brothers and sisters in Christ. See how simple this is? Let's go to a couple other passages as we look at this. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 11. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 11, Therefore comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. You being here tonight is a source of edification. It's building me up that you're here and paying attention to what I'm saying. Hopefully, I'm being edifying to you, to the passages that we are studying. So we edify now. We don't only edify one another collectively. We can do so individually also. But a part of the work of the church, being a part of the church, is to edify one another. In fact, one more passage on that. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4 and Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 16. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 16, it states, From whom the whole body joined and knit together by which every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes the growth of the body for what? The edifying of itself in love. So we have a responsibility of edifying, do we not? More so, the body of Christ, we have the responsibility to build one another up. We do so by encouraging one another. We do so sometimes by correcting one another. You could go on a whole study on how we edify one another. But right now, we're looking simply at the Bible ABCs. So we go from edification. I should let you guess what the next one is. And that is 
fight. Being a Christian, we've got to fight. We've got to fight the good fight of faith. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12. We have recorded for us here, as Paul writes to Timothy, chapter 6 and verse 12, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life to which you were called and have confessed a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Okay, I know this is repetitious, but sometimes repetition is good. We have the right attitude, we go to the right source, we're converted by being baptized, we follow the doctrine of Christ, we help one another to grow, edify one another. And then we got to fight. Oh, yeah, then you got to fight. Now, why do you have to fight? Because we're in the world that's not following the Bible. You got to stand for that which is right. Again, there's too many quick Christians straddling the fence. Get off the fence. Get off the fence. Well, I thought we're supposed to be nice to people. Yes. But we're all supposed to share the truth. We share the truth by sharing it book, chapter, and verse. And we share the truth by living it. We've got to fight. We're in a world that does not follow the Bible. Say what they want to say. They don't follow the Bible. You hear people say, well, we're in a Christian nation. First of all, there's a couple of problems with that. Christian is always used as a noun. So to say it biblically, it would be a nation of Christians, which, sadly, we're not a nation of Christians. We're a nation that has some Christians, just like other nations have some Christians. But if we were a nation of Christians, all of us, this society would be a whole lot better. Would it not? We're in a nation that's very religious, we're in a nation that acknowledges Jesus is the Christ, but even that is slipping. But if we were a nation of Christians, the whole nation of Christians, then we wouldn't have to fight. But we're in a nation of many who are not Christians. Turn with me, if you will, why we have to fight. Let's go to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. Now, when you're studying with somebody, and I'm not saying this should be in the very first discussion, but have you ever thought to let them know it's not going to be easy? It's not going to be easy being a Christian. You're not going to be liked by everybody when you follow the Bible. That, that's just a fact. That's why as people who want to be liked by everybody will never be a fully dedicated Christian. It won't happen. Because you are going to be put in circumstances, whether you like it or not, that's going to challenge you to fight. And I'm not talking a fist fight. I'm talking to stand for what is biblically right, which shows that someone else is doing something biblically wrong. And people don't like to feel that they're wrong. In John chapter 3, let's read that together. In John chapter 3, verse 19 and 20. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. Now, do we have that same problem today? Are men still in darkness today? Are men not liking to come to the light? And they look at someone who comes to the light, and they look at that person as a freak. Right? Adults. Most adults feel you cannot have an enjoyable time unless you drink alcoholic beverages. True or false? As a Christian, I'm a teetotaler. I don't drink any alcoholic beverages. Now, someone in the audience might say, well, show me where it's... I hate it when I hear this. Show me where it's wrong if I take a drink. Well, I can't show you that, but I want to ask you this. 
How is it going to enhance your Christianity? How is it going to enhance your Christianity? Going to be for the good or for the bad? Think about that. You're going to get drunk on one drink? Probably not. Probably not. But have you put a kink in your armor by doing that? It's common sense. I guess I could say it's the same person. Well, show me if you take one joint, you're going to hell. But why should you take the first joint? You get my point? You put a kink in your armor? Honestly, brethren, and I don't know your stand on this. I get very negative towards those who want to justify social drinking. Because there's no justification. And you say, well, what if you're not drunk? How do you enhance teaching others by doing that? I'll give you a true illustration. When I was up in Minnesota, we were able to be involved with a young couple. In fact, the first couple I actually performed a marriage ceremony for. They were in their early 20s. And we got to know each other. And before she learned the truth, she was a part of a denomination. And before they both learned the truth, they would socially drink and maybe sometimes drink to the point where they got drunk. But that's not the lesson. The lesson to me was this, as this young lady who was my sister in Christ as she obeyed the gospel, she said, do you know what started me to drink alcohol? What do you think started her to drink alcohol? Oh, her parents, they had a wet bar in their home. No, but that could start one. What do you think started her to drink alcohol? She saw the denominational minister sitting outside on the porch drinking a beer. And in her young mind, she thought, well, if that minister can drink a beer, it must okay to do what? Drink beer. Now, I'm not saying that starts everybody, but do you see the influence a person has? Why would I want to tarnish my influence to be involved in social drinking? What benefit is it going to do for me or for those around me to enhance my Christianity? Oh, but Timothy took a little wine. Study it more. If you take NyQuil, it's kind of the same thing. So you might hold a different position, but we will lock horns. Because I think if you drink, you are tarnishing your example. And you're tarnishing the example of the Lord's church. Are you not? So we have here, the society says, you're an adult. You can drink, I like how they put it, you can drink adult beverages. Right? Adult beverages. What in the world? Where do you come up with that? How about water? Could that be an adult beverage? How about Dr. Pepper? <laughs> Could that be? <laughs> People shaking their head, no. You either like it or hate it. But <laughs> the point is, why do we fight? Because we're different. Now, I just gave you one illustration. We're different than society. Why don't I go to some parties in the community in which I live? I don't think I'm better than them, but I know what's going to be there. Alcohol. Alcohol is going to be there. I don't want to be there if alcohol is going to be there. I don't think they get drunk when they get together, but it's a no-win situation for me. So I don't go to things like that. Now, it's up to you what you want to do. I'm not telling you what you want to do, but understand this. Your reputation's on the line. But not only is it talk about drinking, it's so many different things as we talk about. Let's go to 1 John chapter 3. And 1 John chapter 3 and verse 13. We have recorded for us here a very simple passage that nobody seems to memorize. In 1 John 3, 13, it says this. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. Wow. Now, that'd be a passage for your bumper sticker, wouldn't it? Now, why would the world hate you? Because you're living by the doctrine of Christ. You're living a different life. And therefore, you're going to have to fight. You're going to have to stand for the truth. 
And the stand for the truth is not simply book, chapter, and verse. The stand for the truth is living for the truth. All right, we're, we're down to the last one. Aren't you glad I didn't do all 26 letters? So one more. Goal. You see how it all comes together? We set our mind. Let's go to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. If then you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things of the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. What's our goal? Our goal is heaven. Turn with me, if you will, to Philippians chapter 3. This summer, and some may like it, some may despise it, this summer we have the Summer Olympics. It's in Paris, France this year. And some, like I said, either like that or some don't. Some don't like it because there is immodesty in the Olympics. There's no doubt about it. But there's a lot of endeavoring and, and dedication to do that. Those people, if you watch it, that we watch in the Olympics and they run those races, they run the marathon, they, they do different events, they make it look so simple, do they not? But <laughs> tell you, we all know it's not simple. Not simple at all. They have their mind focused years ahead of time to get there. They didn't decide a week before, hey, I'm going to go to the Olympics for the United States of America. No, you're not, because you're not going to make it. <laughs> not if you tried a week before. You're going to try year after year after year. You know why they succeed? Because they've got a goal. You know why we as Christians succeed? Because we've got a goal. In Philippians chapter 3, and verses 13 and 14. Brethren, I do not count myself to apprehend, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are above, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So as we look at the chart, there's your Bible ABCs. They all fall in line, do they not? Hope it helped you. Well, I already know all that. Well, I hope you do. I hope you do, but are we living it? Are we living it? If you're here tonight, maybe you're at the C stage. You need to be converted. Well, the brethren here will assist you, taking your good confession and baptizing you for the mission of your sins. But most of us is beyond, are beyond the C stage. We're on the other four stages. Question is, where are we at in those stages as we stand and sing?
Lord's Supper will be served for those that need it. Well, we come almost to the end of our watch. The Lord's Supper is prepared for those who didn't have the opportunity to take up the Lord's Supper this morning. This morning, we talked about why we should take the Lord's Supper. It was instituted by our Lord and Savior in Acts 27. It tells us when we are to take the Lord's Supper. So this is why we do it. Acts 27 is the beginning. It tells us when. Then you can go to one of the scriptures, just one of several, and just tell us what we are to do. In Matthew 26, verse 26, it says, As they was eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. And he took the cup and gave thanks. Thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine until that day I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. So let us give thanks for the bread. Heavenly, Heavenly Father, Thank you for allowing us to be able to come out to take and watch other today. We'll take up the Lord's Supper. Take up this bread which represents your body. We pray, Father, that all who do so, we do so in a way that we're well pleasing unto thee. This prayer down to your son, Jesus' name. Amen. Do anyone need it? The Emma. Let's give thanks for the cup. Heavenly Father, in like manner, thank you for the fruit of the vine which represents your son's blood. We pray, Father, that all who do so will do so in a way that will be well pleasing unto thee. This prayer I do ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper. But also, upon the first day of the week, if the Lord instituted how we are to give back to him. He said we are to give not drudgingly or of necessity for Lord, the God love a cheerful giver. So this is why we give on the first day of the week, so that we can help not only our congregation, but others as well. So let us give thanks. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to be able to come out. Thank you for the blessing you have blessed us with, the material blessing, the physical blessing, Father. We ask that you continue to bless us, Father. Bless us that we give back a portion of that you have blessed us with so that the work of the church can continue. This prayer I do ask in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Anyone wish? Just raise your hand, please. This concludes the Lord's Supper and every aspect of the work where we ought to do on the first day of the week. I want to thank everybody for coming out and pray that he'll, the Lord will keep us safe as we leave this place and bring us back again as we stand in for our closing prayer.
Would you bow with me, please? And Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for this day and for the many opportunities that we've had to be able to study from your word this day. We're thankful, Father, for the opportunities that you've had to meet together, and we pray that everything that we've done today has been pleasing and acceptable to you. We are so very thankful, Father, for your love that caused you to send your son to this earth to live as a time for a time as, as a man so that we could learn from his examples and his teachings. We're most of all thankful, Father, that he was willing to give his life on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven and we could be in a relationship with you and have the hope of heaven. We are so very thankful, Father, for our elders. We pray that you would continue to bless them in their efforts to help this congregation to grow, be with us as the members to not make their jobs difficult, help us to be willing to go to them when we are struggling, especially when we are struggling spiritually, so that they can help us to get back to where we need to be. We're thankful, Father, for our deacons. We pray that you continue to bless them in their efforts to, to serve this congregation. We're thankful for Chuck. We're thankful for the messages that he's brought us this day. We're thankful for the message tonight. We pray that you would be with each and every one of us, help us to have the right attitude as we study our Bibles. We pray, Father, that we would be able to help to lead and convert others to you. We pray, Father, that you would help us to always make sure that we are practicing the doctrine which is in your word. Help us to edify one another in every opportunity that we have to fight for the truth and to always keep the goal in mind, which is to be in heaven with you for eternity. We pray, Father, that you would continue to bless our sick for those who are dealing with everyday uh, sicknesses. We pray that you would be with them and comfort them for those who are do dealing with more ongoing things, tests and procedures and surgeries and, and having to overcome all these things. Father, we pray that you would also comfort them and, and help to keep them strong, help, them to help us to let them know that they are loved and missed and help us to do anything that we can to help them. We pray, Father, that you would Help us all as we struggle from day to day in this, in this life. This world can be difficult at times, but we also know, Father, that even in our darkest hours, no matter how bad things may get on this earth, that you will never leave us. Help us to always remember that so that our faith can remain strong. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.